When we talk of luxury watches, we think Switzerland. Quality engineering, specialization, dominant market position, apparently illustrating the economist David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. But it wasn't always that way. By the turn of the last century, Britain was producing 200,000 watches a year, around half the worldwide output, and Rolex was founded in London in 1905. Yet when your father is killed in a plane accident that almost takes your brother's life as well, it proves to be the inspiration to build a luxury watch brand which could compete with the best. So to tell the story of building Bremont, I am delighted to welcome the co-founder and CEO of Bremont, Bremont Watches, Charles English. Thank you for having me on, Simon. It's a real pleasure. And I've obviously listened to your silky voice for many podcasts. So it's an honor to be yeah, alongside some of your esteemed guests. Obviously, I'm not esteemed, but it's nice to be on here anyway. Thank you for these kind words. Well, let's, let's begin with your childhood. Maybe you can give us a flavor because I think you had an unusually brilliant father. I did. He was this amazing individual, PhD aeronautical engineer from Cambridge, who was um, with the RAF, um, but he, although he was an intellect, he had this amazing dis passion for being in the workshop and talent at it. So our, our life as, as young kids was in this workshop. It was never really going outside playing football with him. Um, it was some sort of fixing building things and anything from cars to aircraft to um, boats. He built a sailing boat, went and lived on his kids for six months to obviously um, uh, watches and clocks. So that was really our whole livelihood growing up was t tinkling around on, on, on little bits of metal and wood. You yourself decide to study engineering with naval architecture, which which is definitely a first on this show. That's quite specific. Um, why? Well, it's uh, obviously my father built this sailing boat and we had this sort of passion for sailing as, as children and and growing up. And I always loved you know seeing him with this drawing board, drawing pictures of, of beautiful sailing boats. I used to build model yachts and I thought, oh, this is just, just brilliant. This is what I want to do. Go and draw beautiful sailing boats and, and then eventually race them and you know build them. So I went to Southampton, which is the sort of number one place almost in the world for doing naval architecture. And then I realized I did four years of doing stress calculations and off bulkheads of super tankers, didn't draw a single sailing boat. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, very, very technical. Uh, and I enjoyed it and I got something out of it. But it, yeah, I didn't draw a single sailing boat throughout my time there. And so therefore, were you already thinking of a different profession? Well, it's, it's interesting. When you're in the world of engineering and, and to that level, your career's advice is very much, well, you, you go into a technical team and as interviewed by you know, aerospace companies. And, and I thought, actually, I don't want to be a hardcore engineer. I've got very much an engineering brain, but carrying on those stress calculations uh, just didn't really excite me. And obviously, as with all engineers at universities, you get the city uh, coming in, looking to get um, those mathematical brains to join. And uh, that's when I, I went into corporate finance post Southampton um, for a small company called Williams de Bro, which uh, I thoroughly enjoyed, but quickly realized I wasn't going to be any good in the city. I was, I was far too much of a, had a sort of entrepreneurial sort of feeling but I learned so much there being there for I think it was about three years just you know understanding reading accounts understanding um you know this we were doing IPO listings so uh I, I learned a lot but I quickly realized that it wasn't the life for me so I want to turn to the tragic events of 1995 um, your father was killed, your brother almost killed when the World War II vintage Harvard plane crashed. And I think you were ready on the ground to take off in the plane behind. Just uh, t tell us a little bit about that day. Yeah, you come across life, these sort of tipping points, these life-changing moments. And for us, uh, it was the most beautiful day, March, sunny day, like it is today. And as a family, so dad, myself, my brother went up to do a day of formation flying in, in these World War II aircraft. And we'd done a lot of flying. I was sponsored through university by the RAF. So dude, th that was very much a big passion of ours. And on that beautiful day, um, 
it all went horribly wrong and I was on the ground and um, I heard over the radio this this crash had happened. I was praying it wasn't dad and Nick and, and it was and um, they crashed. Uh, dad died immediately. Nick shouldn't have survived. Um, he, he broke over 30 bones. He was sort of thrown out into the middle of this, this field. Um, but luckily... Hems Air Ambulance were very close by. They they got to him. They got him to Whitechapel Hospital, and there he sat in uh, or lay in intensive care for many months. But they had this amazing recovery. Well, that whole day just changed my life and Nick's life considerably. And you know, having to call up your mother to tell her that her father's died and her her, her son is in hospital is is possibly the worst thing you can ever do. And and really, I, that triggered this. It's better to go and live life and you've got to make the most of it sort of atmosphere that we created between us. And uh, we just went down this route of following this this passion. And we'd grown up around watches. Our father had this sort of massive desire to sort of fix these clocks and watches. And we were so aware growing up as well of this amazing uh, history of British watchmaking that you uh, mentioned in your introduction. And yeah, 100 years ago, we were making half the world's watches. And at the time that Nick and I had this sort of crazy idea, there, there wasn't a single British watch company you could go and buy off the shelf. And that really triggered this desire to actually, look, let's go and do something um, completely different. And we went off to Switzerland, uh, told our wives it would be you know, two or three years, we, we would do it and please sort of back us. Five years later, we hadn't sold a single watch and we didn't realize quite how hard it was going to be. So, <laughs> yeah, but it all really came from dad's playing crash. Well, I want to rewind, if you excuse the pun, yeah. um, just to frame what happened in the world of watchmaking. When I visited your facility, you mentioned this, you know, Yorkshireman John Harrison, but just tell us, tell, t- set the stage. It's just such a fascinating story. So back in about... 1703, 2,000 sailors were lost coming back from uh, a Spanish armada off the Ciliars. And they were lost because they couldn't measure where they are. They couldn't navigate longitude. And um, you can do latitude with a sextant, but longitude, if you don't know the accurate time, it's impossible. You could be massively out. And the government at the time and, and the king, they um, introduced the Longitude Act. And, and ultimately, it was a reward for all, so three, five million pounds of today's money for anyone who could go and work out a method to actually measure time as sea or measure longitude. And there were lots of different theories of how you could do that. And it's a ridiculously complicated task because not only did you have to map the uh, the stars so accurately, but you had to create a timepiece that would work at sea, and everyone thought that was actually impossible. And John Harrison, a carpenter from Grimsby, came down um, to London, and he really just reinvented the way a clock would work because the only accurate timepiece at the time were pendulum clocks. Obviously, if you put a pendulum clock on a ship, it goes massively out of time with the movement or temperature changes. And he dedicated his life, and um, by about 1760, he had created this uh, marine chronometer. Everyone thought he'd gone slightly mad; it wasn't going to work. This, this was his, you know, not his first attempt. He'd, he'd been at it for many years, and he gave this clock to various captains. One was Captain Cook, who discovered the world, and really. It transformed uh, Britain. You could, we're a seafaring nation. Suddenly we could navigate those seas more accurately. We could turn up to wars with less ships because they could all get there. It dissemination of information, trade the whole lot. And those early chronometers were 30% of the value of the whole ship. So they were, they were incredibly precious items. And that really spearheaded this, uh, this period of British watch and clock making that, um, uh, put us in the in the center point in the world, and hence, obviously, Greenwich Mean Time. But you had Arnold, Marge, Graham, Tompion, all these great British watchmakers, and uh, that was the boom time. Got to nineteen hundreds, and then we had World War, First World War, Second World War. Britain was slow to industrialize, but also, um, you see it in our factory, we can machine to about 
five microns of accuracy. Um, if you can machine to that level, you can build guns, planes, anything. So as soon as the uh, war effort came on, German watch industry and the British watch industry were supporting their own war efforts. Swiss is a neutral country. They carried on making watches and they weren't disturbed there. So Smith was the last British, big British watch company that died out in the 60s. So it's a wonderful history to sort of put into perspective and all these great inventions that came from British watchmakers. And it's such a sad to see that go. Um, but Nick and I um, wanted to do our little bit of resurrecting that. And to resurrect that was not just making a watch in Switzerland, being a British watch company, being made in Switzerland. It was bringing it back to the UK. But you've got the technical issues of how you physically build those watches, but also the branding, the um, getting over this Swiss-made um, area. But yeah, sorry, long-winded way of giving you a bit of a history of British watchmaking there, Simon. Well, it is. I, th I think it is fascinating. Um, but of course, everything's in the name, and Bremont is a very nice name. But how did that appear? Yeah, not very English, is it? Um, so when we when we started, Nick and I didn't want to go buy an old um, British name. I could have gone and bought the name Harrison. Um, if you look at all those, something like 750 Swiss watch companies, so many of those are resurrected brands. They weren't trading um, 50 years ago. They were resurrected. Um, we didn't want to do that because how as a company could we work with the military, um, you know, Master Baker, Jaguar, all these different uh, amazing partnerships we have, but if we were still pretending we were uh, uh, marine chronometer manufacturers from 1760. So we wanted to create our own brand. Uh, obviously, my surname's English. It wasn't going to work very well on trademarking and on a dial of a watch. And uh, this 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 slightly random instant, about three years after Dad died and we were, we were tinkering with our watches, um, we didn't have a name on the watch at that point. And Nick and I were on a, um, a flying trip, one of our many flying trips. And these are days before GPS. And we were flying over France and we got in some terrible weather. We just couldn't find the airfield. It's a low mist. And we just we were running out of fuel and we had to force land in a, a French farmer's pea field. And if you do that in the UK or the US, you just give the farmer a bottle of whiskey and say sorry um, and take off when the weather's better. But in France, they impound your aircraft, they make you take the wings off, they ship it to an airfield. It's a disastrously expensive um, thing to be caught out on. So there we were in this French farmer's pea field, and this lovely old boy came over and said, no, no, put it in my hay barn, wait till the weather gets better. And we ended up staying with him for a couple of days, and, and he's this wonderful old character in his late 70s. And he, he, were, yeah, he would have been our dad. My dad died when he was 48. So, all 49, and had he lived to this age, he would have been just like this old boy playing around with clocks and old motorbikes and tractors. And, uh, and we left um, a couple of days later, and, and his name was Antoine Bremont. And we thought, Bremont, actually, that's quite a nice sounding name. So, we called him up and said, Look, we're not going to associate you at all with this. We just let the name. Um, are you happy with this? And he went, Ah, oh, crazy Englishman. <laughs> and that was it. So, that's where the name Bremont came from. So there are two components, as I see it, to um, to your business. You're building a watchmaking capability and you're building a luxury brand. How do you and your brother, who uh, you need to just qualify exactly what he does with you in the company, but how do you think about those two components? Well, first, my brother does a really good job of sweeping floors and cleaning the windows. And um, no, actually, he's, he's the talented one. Uh, it's... So I probably work um, a bit more on the marketing now. Uh, Nick does a bit more on the product. But really, we overlap in so many different areas. We've got a brilliant team now within the business who are doing most of the, the, the hard work. The challenge, as you said, is we wake up every morning. We are one of the most accurate machinists of metal in the country because we make watches. You have to be working machines that you know are almost a million pounds um these are very complicated cnc machines to training up watchmakers in a country that hasn't made watches um yes they've been servicing watches but haven't been making new watches for so many years so putting apprenticeship schemes for training up watch assemblers and watchmakers so really our our, our day job is how can you make 
this beautifully made mechanical watch. We only do cogs and gears that will be chronometer rated and will will work, not come back, not break, and be beautiful um, and uh, appealing to the general public out there. But on the other hand, you can make the best product in the world, but if no one knows about you, um, you're never going to actually get out there. And you're having to build a global brand because that businessman wants to see you in Hong Kong and New York and London. Um, so, and, and our competition are spending hundreds and hundreds of millions on marketing. So that that's always the challenge. You have to be a very good marketeer and a very good engineering business. And obviously we own our own retail stores as well. So you have to be a good retailer. So it's deeply complicating and you're up against some incredibly good competition. And our competition are generally the groups. They're owned by you know, the Richemont, LVMHs, the Carings, the, uh, the, the big groups. But we saw it as saying, look, it's a big market out there. All we need is a, is a slight percentage of that market to actually build a, a very successful business. And, and what is lovely is we're not in tech in terms of you know, what luxury watches will go out of fashion and in the next two years' time, you have to grow very quickly. It's about building that long-term luxury brand in a sustainable way in the UK. So it, it does keep you awake, though. I think you said seeing is believing in the context of watches, and I and I mentioned in the in the blurb on the podcast that they having been to your new facility and just sort of you know as a non-engineer, just how sort of stunned stunned I was by his excellence. But what is it when people visit your facility that you think happens to them? Yes, Simon, it's a very good point. When you uh, touch, we go to a retailer and buy that watch. You put it on your wrist. You like the look of it. It's the right size. It sort of it fits you. Um, you buy it, so you take it home. But really, you have no conception of how complicated and all the efforts and investments gone into building that watch and the skills created accordingly. So when you come to Henley, it's so nice to now to be able to show you this is how the parts are machined those colts and gears uh all ticking way together this is how finite this is how complicated they are to produce and put together and, and just really showing that you know in a day there's eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in a day a mechanical watch that we sell will be within three or four seconds accurate and if you think that's the most accurate mechanical um object out there is a uh, is a chronometer rate of mechanical watch it's genius engineering and and this has been worn on your wrist 24 7 you know, it needs servicing every four or five years but that watch will last 200 years you know that there's no reason why that watch can't be um if serviced and repaired it will work in 20 years time and and i love that and when you come to henley suddenly you can see the light bulb moment go off in people's heads and go yeah, yeah, yeah i totally understand why it costs that much money and uh um yeah so it's lovely lovely to finally have a, a, a facility where we're happy showing people around but are there going to be fewer watches as many young people are thinking about being able to answer the phone off their wrist it's a very good question and i think the we've seen out of nowhere, Apple has become the largest watch brand in the world. And it's, it's an amazing feat. But where I think that's really affected is, is the fashion watch market. Um, people have gone for the iWatch, but it still doesn't give you that statement piece. You know, however much you pay for Apple Watch, you're going to chuck it away in two years' time and get a, get a new one. It has no long-term value associated with that. So I think we... The, a lot of individuals will wear both and they'll have their smart watch for their exercise and, and other areas. But actually, um, long-term value, it's about the only piece of jewellery um, uh, a man wears. And it's it's a lovely thing to collect. Um, over the years, you, you should make money on it or lose very little. So it's it's still got a lot going for it. And But I think getting the young into it um, is very important. I think the fact they're used to wearing something on their wrist, if it is a smart watch, that actually helps. Is getting people wearing it. 
but no one really quite knows where the market will go over the next 10 years. But uh, that's, you really in our space, I can't even compete with that. I can't think about it too much. I just have to do my best at growing the brand and taking market share from everyone else. So if the whole market is not growing, that doesn't really bother me as long as more people are buying my watches. And we're ambitious. To invest in the UK, we um, need to grow ourselves as a business. Otherwise, we can't put that extra engineering investment in. So we, we need to grow as a business and we need to grow around the world. So when we look at your collections, you have worked with the, the, the collections around Concord, Jaguar, Stephen Hawking, Bletchley Park. And I think in many cases, there are components of those uh, sort of topics in the watch. Tell me a little bit about how that came about and how you think about you know the next collection. Yes, so every year, the, the watches you're referring to are, are big limited edition pieces. And um, it all happened uh, about 12 years ago. We came up with a watch. A, a friend of my father's owns a very famous Spitfire that uh, is totally original. And he's replacing part of the panel on the wing. And he held this metal. He said, do you realize this is being flown over Germany? And by a 19-year-old boy, on this day um, in 1940, and we, we looked at it, and it's very emotional. We saw the clock in the Spitfire, and it was off an old Smith's clock, and this sort of light bulb moment went off. It said, look, why can't we actually do a, a watch? We'll pull the EP120 off the Spitfire, and we'll put that metal into the watch and create something which is really unique, only making 120 watches. And we did, and they sold immediately, and we realized, actually, these historical limited editions one that we'll do one a year and we create something which is quite unique. And yeah, the most recent one was um, the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And we could raise a lot of money for charity in the process, but we're creating something which is mechanically stunning. Um, each movement is very different in those watches, but has that historical reference. And that's got meteorite wood from Stephen Hawking's desk, paper from one of his um, uh, seminal theses within it but you are creating this sort of total work of art. Um, and they've become big PR pieces that, for us as well. And now there's lots of spin-offs of other companies copying us now and what we're trying to do with that. But I think uh, we, the trick is never to be gimmicky, um, raise a chunk for charity in the process, and, and that's very important for us to do. But when you come through our, um, the wing, our facility, and you see all the different bits working with right flower and sort of fabric from the first wing of the first plane that ever flew. We did enough to restore Wilbur and Orville's family home in Dayton, Ohio, off the back of it. And as you said, Bletchley Park, HMS Victory. These amazing watches. And we'll have collectors who'll buy every single one of them and um, uh, built a lot of friends through them. And in parallel with that, the types of um, machines you have doing this very fine work, are they, whilst they predominantly exist in Switzerland, are they made in Switzerland? Is it a pretty closed market? We've had to work the Swiss um, for many years and, and build some very close relationships. It is quite a closed market, um, but we wouldn't be here now without the Swiss. They've helped us considerably. The machines... Um, probably half machines we're the only watch company ever to have bought one outside switzerland um the other machines are um we work with dmg mori um which is a uh, german japanese business and they make a lot for the aerospace um most sports industry you see them a lot in four and one um engineering but we've had to convert these to work for us um and we've had to train new new um skill sets on it because when you're machining to those micron levels, there's just nothing else that needs to be that accurate apart from watchmaking. So literally we're getting engineers who have been in the industry um, working in aerospace or motorsports and we're retraining them. And then the finishing on these, the, what else is produced in metal that people get a loop out and look through the loop and it has to be utterly perfect. There's just nothing else that really happens like that so it's incredibly challenging um but really rewarding when you get it right and um yes the, the swiss have been supportive to us and 
And I think they want, it's, it's in their interest to make um, the mechanical watch industry to, to, to have, get through certain barriers. The quality has to be there and they're very protective over that as they should be. But on the other hand, we are waving this British flag of actually saying, look, the Swiss are very good marketeers. I know the Swiss are dominant in the watch industry now, but they were not always dominant. And we are playing our little part in that revival of British watchmaking. Where else are you globally? Well, the key markets for us are the US. We have our own store in um, Madison and New York and just about to open in LA, but we've got wholesale across the US. UK is a very strong market for us. The Asia, we've stored in Hong Kong, um, Australia. So they have some key markets and then China launching in Shanghai and, and growing out there. So a Asia, I think will go from being um, uh, at probably 5% of our business and that will grow considerably over the next two or three years if we can get that right. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, you've got to change your messaging when you go to a new market. The whole brands, you know, the, the made in England works in England, but does that work in China when they just want Swiss made when it comes to watches? So it, it's a challenging area. And also 20% you know, of our business is just making for the military around the world. And that's predominantly UK and the US. That message is not going to resonate well in China when you're, um, uh, positioning US jet pilots. So you, you have to um, really be very careful about how you're branding and pushing that forward. So I think you referred um, at some point in time, uh, you were given sort of their three rules about starting up a business. Um, uh, and they're all around sort of, you know, how tough it is. Tell me about that. And how tough has it been? But you know, we, we developed quite early into the into our business. And my advice for any entrepreneur doing anything is this three times rule. And that is, and it's undoubtedly true, it always takes three times longer. It always costs three times more. And it's three times more effort. And if you're not willing to really go for that three times rule on day one, then give up now because it never goes directly to plan, um, but that hard work really shines through. And I think we've we've done something that no one else has really done in the luxury watch industry, especially for not the last 20 years. And that's incredibly exciting. And yes, we can sort of pat ourselves on the back, but we feel we're only just starting really in, in what we can do um, and what we should be doing. But it's Back then, you have to sort of readdress that three times rule and say, "Look, God, I, am I have I really got that energy and 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 investment to sort of go on to that next level?" And and I think with any business, any entrepreneur, people can give up far too easily or or underinvest. And it does take investment. What we're trying to do is, it, we'd have made so much more money if we just outsourced the manufacturing. All other watch brands our size out there just don't do any of it themselves they just outsource it all and they just do the frontline branding but that wouldn't have been any fun that wouldn't have built up british watchmaking and you know, the, the enthusiasm you get from clients walking in and seeing that big machine wearing away machining metal is is just too much fun for dick and myself so it's it's a long-term journey we're on um but i think yeah if we can continue that three times we're all we'll get that you were a corporate financier for a while. This is when we talk about patient capital. This is a long-term payback industry. How have you gone about identifying and partnering with long-term investors? That's a really good point. If if we got our standard VC, VCs in, you want that sort of three to four year turnaround, that would have been very difficult. Um, the benefit for us, though, is that every year we're building up brand we're creating more value in the business um and our business will be here in 30 years time it's not a tech play that will be gone or you know, that the high risk so you won't get that ridiculous high growth but you will have that longevity in, in who we are and we're very lucky to get um some investors earlier on who really backed that long-term play of what we were able to, to achieve. And I think if you are happy to take that long play, they will get the return. There's no doubt about that. Um, 
but you have to really give it um, that uh, that time. And we've shown that, and we've created something that I think everyone in the team are very proud of. Uh, but you're and eventually, yes, for them, they need to see an exit. So how that exit comes is it a if selling their individual shares or or a, a total sale? Who knows? But really, I think from Nick and my self perspective, you can't aim for that. Even if the business ever did get sold, Nick and I would still be very much involved with the business. It's this is our baby. This is something we love, and you. But you have to ultimately, when you get investors on, you have to give them a return. So quite how that pays out. So I think the you know, are there benefits for listing a business like ours? Possibly, but I think listing you need. Uh, you need a real reason to go and list. Is it to make acquisitions? Is it a, a brand growth piece? Because it's not really an exit. Um, do we want to be bought by a Swiss company that one of the big groups that will want to close down UK manufacturing because it doesn't fit in with their you know, centralized model? Um, well, that won't work for us. So uh, who knows where we'll end up? I mean, what... Do you wish you'd known 15 years ago when you were starting out? We have achieved what we wanted to achieve. But I think along the line, uh, when you're building a business, you make big mistakes. And those mistakes may be around timings for investment. They may be around product growth, going to new markets without being prepared enough or with that investment behind it. I think we've learned huge amounts along the way. And that, that whole thing, my advice of anyone going into a new market is it, it, you've got to properly do your diligence beforehand. And that costs money. Just because you've got one client who wants your to take your product on is not good enough. So put that proper investment into it. Um, but would we have changed anything different into Nick and I with this mad idea and starting out and going to watches? No, could we have made quicker money by doing other things, uh, jumping on you know, other trends? Probably yes. Um, but the satisfaction we've got together, and it's it's amazing when you have, um, you know, last week Harrison Ford, you know, decided he called us up and through a friend of a friend and said, "Look, yeah, you know, I, I love watches, I love aircraft. Is it possible to come for a tour around your facility?" And it, how many other businesses do you get that? And uh, uh, yeah, Nick Mason flew in last week and had a tour out. And these are people who are generally passionate about watches. And, and our customers are such lovely people. It's a, it's a wonderful space to be in. And not everybody sets up and runs a business and holds a business together with a member of their family. Um, t- t- any advice on, 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 on running a business with a uh, brother or sister? Yeah, I think make sure you get on with them very well beforehand. And, I think that the, the lovely thing about working with family is one, we do product design together. We, we've grown up with the same taste. We like the same things. That makes it easy. But I think with running any business, any partnership, it's all about trust. Can you trust the partner you're working with? And, and I've always known that Nick would never screw me and I would never screw him. And ultimately, if it's a business partner um, who's not family, he will put his own interests above yours. And that's just fact. And if when all is going well, um, you don't argue. When the when it's not going well, that's when the cracks appear. And and that's the beautiful thing about working with Nick. And I, I think had I done it with anyone else along the way, uh, it wouldn't have worked. And, and I'm lucky that he's very talented at what he does. And... Um, uh, helps to you know, deliver what we have delivered with it without that. And it's been fun. The only downside is, you know, Nick is my best mate who I only see work-wise now. So um, very little on the, on the fun side together, um, which is the downside. What's the most important daily habit you have? Well, actually, in, in, in slight sadness ways, but I've got become slightly obsessed with gardening. And, and going out into the garden, at some, some time out at this sort of hectic world we live in, just to really sit back and take in nature and get away from everything. Get away from your phone because your head is down in a flower bed. For not much, but I try and go out every day and do something. And if you could fly anywhere in the world, 
a little island of Thailand, I think, probably at the moment with my family for that sort of uh, uh, that getaway. But either that or into space. I quite like the idea of uh, going on, you know, sitting next to Bezos and all France and going up in, in space, experiencing that. Fantastic. Well, maybe we send a copy of it and hang it in Maudlin College yeah. and they'll be enlightened. <laughs> yeah, <Exactly>. Anyway. <laughs> Um, Giles, thank you so much. I, um, as I, as I've said, and I, and, and I think anybody who would and could come and see your facility in Henley should do so. And we'll make the show, uh, make, make sure the links are available on the show to be able to, you know, to contact you because it really is absolutely inspiring to see a manufacturing facility, which is just state of the art and uh, the collections alongside it, which are so timeless. Um, so congratulations on what has been an extraordinary journey. Well, really appreciate that. And, and we'd love to show anyone around. And Simon, thank you. I'm honoured to have been on your show. Uh, clearly, there are people a uh, lot more interesting than myself, but um, it's been an interesting journey. It's lovely to tell the story.